Xiaoping Li, MD, PhD, is professor of medicine and Linda and Stuart Resnick Endowed Chair in Human Nutrition at the David Geffen School of Medicine at the University of California, Los Angeles, UCLA. She currently serves as Director of Center of Human Nutrition and Chief of Division of Clinical Nutrition at UCLA. Dr. Lee completed her MD and PhD in Physiology at Peking University and her residency training was completed at the UCLA Medicine Program in 1996, where she also served as Chief Medical Resident. She has been a faculty member at UCLA since 1997 Dr. Lee is board certified in internal medicine and as a physician nutrition specialist, serving as president of the National Board of Physician Nutrition Specialists, NBPNS, from 2018 to 2020. She's been an active member of the American Society for Nutrition since 2009, where she has served on the ASM board of directors and various committees. Dr. Lee's research interests focus on diet and nutrition, coronary artery disease, diabetes education, and using customized diets to influence inflammatory diseases. Most recently, her research has focused on identifying novel treatment approaches from inflammatory bowel disease and developing evidence-based frameworks for precision nutrition. Dr. Lee has been a principal investigator for over 100 investigator-initiated NIH and industry-sponsored clinical trials and published over 220 peer-reviewed scientific journals. She has co-authored two textbooks and a third one will be published in 2023. Dr. Lee, we appreciate your leadership with ASN and we thank you for your time today. Thank you, Dante. I'll be glad to be here with you today. Well, thank you, Dr. Lee. So Dr. Lee, you see patients and also conduct research, which is great to note that you're both a research and a practitioner in clinical nutrition. How do the nutrition issues you see in your clinical work impact your research? That is a great question. We often talking about research and talk about clinical practice kind of in a separate way. But the truth is the clinical practice is truly where the research question coming from. The drive to do clinical research is truly to answer bedside questions that have arised from the patient and from our uh, daily practice. Nutrition have a very wide spectrum uh, in clinical practice. Start one end will be more uh, you know, classic or conventional nutrition support. Even in that field, and we have moved from focus on maintaining body weight and help people gaining weight from chronic diseases or malignancy to really now focus on really preserve body functions, not just purely with and body weight up or down as a clinical indicator. The reason for that is truly from our clinical research. We have learned that not just the body weight matters, but the lean body mass, body function, organ function matters more. And from the um, you know, practice of just give calories, it doesn't matter, come from fat, carbs, protein, to now really focus on dietary quality as well to make sure patients have adequate protein support for lean body mass, immune function, adding vitamins, minerals, phytonutrients to really optimize a patient's condition and overall, not just body weight. So that is you know, uh, the um, side of the malnutrition. Even today, we start recognize um, to uh, you take a cancer patient, for example, and nutrition support is not just there maintaining body weight, but it is also impact on the patient's response to ongoing therapy. That can be you know, chemotherapy, radiation uh, treatment, or planning for future surgeries. And nutrition is every step of the way and play a key role. 
even after the acute episode. And nutrition it is also essential for prevention of recurrence and other chronic diseases down the time, down their lifetime. And on the other extreme of nutrition practice, there'll be overnutrition, that's obesity. And as we all know, and that, you know, obesity, uh, pre, uh, you know, really pandemics have set the stage for chronic diseases from cardiovascular disease, diabetes, all the way to cancer. And that is a clinical challenge. And that is also the driver for clinical research. And we have moved on from look at obesity, just energy balance issue to really looking at not only you know calories dietary quantity but also dietary quality and looking at other things beyond you know calorie including process aid and um and also the modern um process of food how that impact on you know obesity and you know the adipose size and proliferation so from those two extreme examples, you can see, you know, clinical practice and research are really linked, one driving the other and one, you know, really support the other. So that is how we are moving the field and forward, hopefully to benefit all of us, the entire population with high quality of life and longer uh, you know, lifespan. So that's the passion I have for nutrition practice and nutrition research. Thank you, Dr. Lee. Um, that's a great answer. Um, as a physician working in nutrition, how important would you say accurate and practical nutrition information is for the physician community? I think it is the key for physicians to know nutrition so we can help our patients. And talking about our daily practice, the most common um, disease we're seeing today are the cardiovascular disease, diabetes, and metabolic syndrome. All of them are related to nutrition. And as we're looking at the dietary guidelines, is you always really see First line therapy is diet, exercise, and lifestyle modification. And however, and physicians have not been really come to the par to really practice that and make that effective for all of our patients. And often, and we are, uh, you know, quickly moved on pharmacotherapy and pro prescribe medications and uh, not addressing the fundamental issues where those chronic disease originated. And there are even times we, you know, really go to more loss resort, uh, such as surgery. And I think that there is a critical need for us to provide information beyond just dietary guidelines and to the physicians. And until then, and we can truly um, appreciate and the issues of each individual patient of ours, so we can help them to not only deal with the issue right now, but adapting a personalized, healthy lifestyle for them to enjoy. And that can be next 20 years, next 30 years, or even longer. So I think that your question is so relevant and we should really pull our effort all together to really focus on getting our physicians the right education. And so they can then be the agent of change and to really get the right information and to have the right um, you know, set of skills to help each one of our patients. 
Thank you for that perspective. I, I think it's always great to look at our physician community and their needs. By the way, how can ASN uh, best involve physicians and other healthcare professionals and providers in our, we have a vision for a healthier world through evidence-based nutrition. So what can we do? What can ASN do? Can we translate research into guidance practice? Uh, what information can we do to provide for physicians, for their patients? I mean, there's so much more that we can do, but tell us. Okay, and I have been an ASN member uh, lifelong. And the reason for that is I really see ASN is a home and for um, all the researchers, trans trans basic research and translational research and the providers all together. And this is the home we can mingle and we can truly communicate Clinicians can raise the questions and from clinical practice, from the bedside, and to directly to our basic research scientist or our translational researchers. On the other hand, and the basic research, the rigor of ASM members can really provide and uh, you know really the um, knowledge and to clinicians and also to the translational researchers and truly bridging basic research and clinical practice. And I think uh, um, ASN, it is in such a unique position and such a unique you know, professional organization and having all three pieces all together. And that is so critical. We're not fragmented and we are under one tent and intimately and constantly and communicate. And there's so much information out there on the internet. Being a clinician and even myself get confused. I cannot tell you know, how much it is scientifically based for you know, particular information out there. And, but you know, under ASN, I can directly address the questions. Let's say, you know, can be, uh, you know, one specific uh, minerals or vitamins or phytonutrients and directly to my colleagues whose expertise is doing basic research, is specifically studying that vitamin and that mineral. If I have any doubt, about the direct link from basic research that can be the cells, that can be the animals to human. And then I go to my uh, translational uh, research uh, colleagues and to see what they have found in the clinical trials, preclinical trials. And there's no place like that. In addition to that, and ASN have uh, journals, right? We have basic research and journal of nutrition and all the way to, you know, um, you know, the American Journal of Clinical Nutrition is more uh, clinical. And they're also the advances, more of, you know, what's happening in the field and the facts or the visionary from the uh, expert in the field. And I've been always excited to really pushing, you know, uh, you know my colleagues and to take advantage of all of those opportunities. And I've been participating as well to have, you know, not only clinical tracks in our annual meetings, but also ongoing learning opportunities like a nutrition grand rounds. And so we have, uh, um, you know, so many different options and for the uh, basic researchers to teach and for the clinical uh, practitioners to learn. Um, so that those are all my passions. On top of all that, and ASN also has a very active advocating uh, group and effort. So we are not just focused on ourselves and we also making uh, really effort to uh, really have an impact on dietary guidelines and on um, public policies so that our impact can be beyond American Society of Nutrition to the American population or globally. 
uh, I think that is another very important uh, role uh, ASN has been playing. Uh, I am very uh, honored to be part of it. That's great. Um, actually, this is uh, this is a lot. Uh, what can physicians do to provide better patient care and improve health, uh, prevent diseases, uh, other areas where nutritional in intervention strategies can play a critical role in healthcare? All right. So, and I think uh, most of the chronic diseases we're dealing with today, um, uh, you know, really have, um, you know, the imprint of nutrition either deficiency or over um, nutrition. And we actually now start to come recognize who we are today. And only 30% at the most, we can point the fingers at our parents and say, hey, this is all your fault. You gave us the bad genes. The other 70% are truly in control of our own hand in a sense how did we live our life? How did we, or have we been taking care of our own body? All of that dynamic um, part of it, and um, you know, major, uh, you know, uh, section portion, and uh, we control is nutrition, and we, you know, take, um, you know, our regular three meals, or we have our snacks, and when we stressed, we eat for comfort. And that is a major part of our lifestyle, of course. And there is activity and, uh, you know, interface with the nutrition and really, you know, matters how nutrition is simulated into part of us. So in nutrition, it is really and uh, uh, making us who we are at this moment and determines of overall health conditions. And their individuals has, you know, genetic um, uh, risk factors for even, you know, cancer. But you know, lifestyle can modify the course or decrease the ri risk and to have the individual have delayed um, the inevitable or actually really mitigate uh, that risk altogether. And give an example of diabetes, particularly type two diabetes. And the first line therapy is uh, lifestyle modifications. In our hand, in our clinical practice, and we recently published about 2000 um, people in our clinic with prediabetes. And after three months, and 70% of them can return to normal uh, glucose metabolism. And type 2 diabetes, particularly in the early stage, it is completely reversible if we really working with our patient. I understand, and we hear a lot of uh, um, you know, stories about failure. And one of the issues we start to recognize is that we are all different. And you know the conventional thinking of we're going to find one diet for everyone to be healthy and to really um, deal with their glucose issues, it is flawed. And that is the reason um, NIH uh, this year, January, launched a $170 million uh, research uh, uh, effort. It's called Nutrition for Procedural Health. And the whole purpose of that is truly address one fundamental issues, and that is what is the best diet for a given individual? And we're not only genetically, you know, uh, different and from the lifestyle, and we live in different place, and we have different ethnic background. We, um, you know, breathe in different air. We have different social connections. And we live with the families and either with the kids or not, and we eat in the restaurants or we eat at home. We're so all different. And that is the goal of procedural nutrition. And it is not just, you know, really assume everyone is the same, but one size, um, one size fits all. 
But now we actually wanted to have everyone have a customized and best solution, nutrition, activity, overall lifestyle for everyone to live better in the goal of to prevent chronic diseases, and but also as true treatment options and to help them mitigate disease as a treatment option. And of course, overall goal is for everyone to enjoy life and not just today, but for a long time to come. So I think that nutrition is, is so important for uh, practicing providers that can be you know, physicians, dietitians, nurse practitioners, or other uh, health uh, providers. And we truly uh, need to get ourselves um, educated, armed with the right uh, knowledge of nutrition so we can be truly the reliable source for our patient. And we can also be the agent of a change and to really and translate the basic research achievement mm -hmm. and all the way to each individual a patient. That is the very reason I you know, have a passion to be in the American Society of Nutrition because that is truly a place and to really learn uh, for myself and really collaborate with my researchers and also um, directly bring the knowledge I have learned and to my peers um, in clinical practice. Well, that's great. So um, I'm glad you, you started talking about the NIH and the work that they're doing in precision nutrition. So what makes it possible nowadays to take a closer look at nutrition, uh, precision nutrition at the individual level? Aha. So one thing is obviously uh, technology. And, you know, we used to think what matters, it is what get into our blood. And we do blood tests and, you know, if we go see a doctor, got to have to do that, right? A um, little bit more than that would be do a urine test. And we really do stool studies. But, you know, moving forward, you'll see those start to change. And for example, and uh, we have, uh, you know, the gastrointestinal tract has larger, uh, small bowels and larger bowels. We used to think, you know, all the digestion absorption happening in the small bowel and the large bowel, just a storage place, maybe make it a few vitamins by the bacteria and not much about that. And about 10, 15 years ago, we start to learn, actually there's trillions, hundred trillions of bacteria in our large intestines predominantly. They are not just there by chance, and now we learned they actually is a part of our body and really talking about all the cells from head to toe, right? 90% of the live cells are actually microbes and 10% of the cells are our human cells. So we're kind of really emerged in the ocean of microbes. And you can imagine how much impact they have on us. Almost every you know, interface we have with the environment, right? That can be gastrointestinal tract, our skin, the urinary tract, and uh, the respiratory tract. And in the intersection with the environment, there are always microbes there. And it is not directly we human cells interface with the environment. So, and what's, what their overall health it would impact on our whole body function as well. And on the other hand, you know, we are not able to blame everything to the microbes, right? So uh, we used to think and uh, take a bite, it just matters how much we got absorbed. And we, now we know, take a bite, and the, you know, after we absorbed everything and rest of it going to the larger bowels, and the bacteria got to work on them or eat on them. And then they release metabolized smaller molecules. And that directly then can be get into our circulation or locally working with our you know, gut uh, cells and particularly immune cells, and then trigger the whole immune response. 
And I'll give you an example. There was a publication just a week ago on sale and start showing and long um, time we suspected and sugar substitute, you know, uh, the now nutrient um, uh, sweetener and uh, can have impact on gut microbiome. And then, and uh, have um, actually negative impact on our glucose metabolism. And two of them, one is um, a cellulose, uh, no, sucrose, and the second one is a saccharin, and really can impair our glucose metabolism through change of gut microbiomes. So this is definitely technology. Mm -hmm. And uh, the other aspect, you know, we also now learning from uh, um, technology it is we have much higher power to detect what is in the blood, not just the cholesterol, glucose, and uh, you know, a weak hormones. Now we can detect 250 uh, compounds at any given time. That's called metabolomics. And we also can, you know, analyze the stool and uh, doing the same and to looking at what are in, in the gut. It is leftover from human beings. We secrete to the, um, the you know, intestine and what's been produced by the bacteria. And even the food, there's a food met, uh, metabolism. We can break down the food and to the level of which is not just looking at carrots, say, oh, it got, you know, fibers, beta carotene, some water. No, we can break it down to much refined levels and to almost like a fingerprint. And so we have so much knowledge, but on top of everything, and you know, medicine is no different from others, is also take the crown rule of the technology right now, artificial intelligence, and trying to and you know have all those information in one place. And so that would make us, um, you know, have the power in the very near future to really tell, um, you know, like you and me on a digital level, how's our body functioning? And ideally we would know, you know what, when we, the time we're talking and you need, uh, you know, water. Uh, you may also need a little caffeine or you need this vitamin C, or you just need it now, you know, to go out uh, for a walk, or maybe you need to walk, uh, you know, how many um, hundred of steps. So that would be, you know, really the future. And not just, you know, overall how we need to do, but on individual level, what's your status and what you should do. And that would be the dr real dream and come true. No, it's obvious that you're excited about precision nutrition and with success you've already had at the VA with that 70% doing better than where they started, which is great. How do you see the area of precision nutrition impacting the future of public health? Uh -huh. So I think the public health policy uh, have been driven pretty much by population-based study. Um, they are typically associations, meaning, you know, we uh, do a study and, you know, that can be 100,000 people. We're looking at their characteristics. I, we go, oh, okay, if your body weight is high or your body mass index is high and the same like more people have diabetes, high blood pressure, high cholesterol. And then we have a guideline say, hey, everyone should lose weight. And, um, you know, that has been the uh, public um, policy really being driven. With personalized or procedural nutrition or medicine, we will see, and the guidelines is going to be formed based on, you know, each individual's response and go upwards from each individual not assuming everyone the same, that is the population study, and also from each individual and go higher up and become a umbrella and policy, but with the specifics for you know, different category of individuals. And on the other hand, 
And by study, each individual will hopefully would be truly the information from causative, meaning, oh, okay, this individual doing this, we know, and would really increase the risk for high cholesterol or, uh, you know, diabetes. And it's no longer just a simple association. And so those are the two major aspects I can see and how the public um, policy uh, would really uh, come along. The also another um, advantage would be not just dietary guidelines with advance of technology. We also gonna be understand the food and the agriculture uh, much better. And that would help us to address the issues of food quality, sustainability, and food security uh, as well, not just uh, American, but globally. Um, so we are, um, you know, part of um, the member of, you know, international society. And that is another part, you know, ASN has um, really uh, a large group of scientists, or we call, uh, you know, research interest group and address that. And we also, um, you know, have in particularly researchers and uh, advocates uh, for um, policy and link with the basic research. And I think that is also important to address, you know, diversity, disparity, and uh, global nutrition transition issues. I think uh, together, and we all working from one part of the big equation and uh, on the platform of ASN is providing us. And so we can really, um, really move up the whole guideline, nutrition science, food, um, uh, you know, science all forward and not just provide the best nutrition for Americans and but for all the citizens. Uh, globally. Yeah, I'm glad you said that because, as you know, uh, we look at ASN's vision, and our vision is for a healthier world through evidence based nutrition. How do you see ASN's role as a leader uh, in this worldwide community of nutrition uh, with our interactions with our other international associations that you mentioned, and also with the International Union of Nutritional Sciences? I think ASN has always been a active member of, um, you know, the nutrition society globally. Um, even ASN uh, by name is American Society of Nutrition, um, but its member is way beyond the boundary of uh, United States. Uh, at our annual meeting every year, and we see colleagues from all over uh, the world and from Europe and from Asia, and from Africa. And I think uh, it is really a global gathering at uh, our meeting, and particularly with uh, the virtual um, you know, choice. And we really see uh, more of our international colleagues able to join the annual you know, meeting and uh, to really mingle and share ideas and um, to really move the field uh, forward. And on the other hand, uh, ASN has been active and in participating in international meetings or really have um, ASN members to be speakers at, at uh, you know, Euro European meetings. I've been there myself as well, uh, Asia, and uh, as well, um, I think that further and really provide um, really opportunities for the researchers and policymakers and globally uh, to get together. I think ASN also leveraging it is as um, globally recognized journals and to provide another home for international researchers and to able to share ideas. So I think uh, ASN is truly uh, on its own, is a global uh, organization. And um, our members 
uh, have never been uh, more excited than now to be um, part of the global society and contribute and you know as much as we could and collaborating with all our colleagues um, globally to really address the nutrition challenges facing the entire, uh, you know, global, uh, the world uh, family. That's great. I mean, being on the administrative side where I work, it's really fascinating to see the uh, interactions and the collaborations that happen between scientists, not just within the U.S., but really on in an in international level. So thank you for that. Really, thank you so much for your time today, Dr. Xiaoping Li. Um, through its membership and programs, the American Society for Nutrition is excited to support the work of our 8,500, that's 8,500 members, and they are located in more than 100 countries around the world. ASN's vision is for a healthier world through evidence-based nutrition, and our mission is to advance science, the education, and practice of nutrition. Visit us at nutrition.org to learn more about ASN membership and programs. Thank you so much again. Thank you.